Game Theory just released part two of their Five Nights at Freddy's timeline, and I want to talk about it. A lot of you suggested that I do one video per part of the timeline, but for reasons you'll see, I think it's best that I do one video for parts one and two, and a video for any other part that he comes out with. Originally just part three, but it seems like there might be a part three and a part four. We'll see. So slices, put on your aprons, and let's bake ourselves a theory. First, let's gather our ingredients. Typically, when I talk about somebody else's theory on this channel, I like to just assume their theory is true and talk about the repercussions that theory would create. I do this because I find that debunking theories can be a bit harsh, and if I just sit here agreeing with the theory, then what was the point of the video? It's a tricky line to work with, but since I can't really talk about the repercussions in the timeline if the theory is the timeline, we're gonna have to actually do some theory critique. So right up at the top, I wanna be clear. Whenever I'm critiquing this theory, keep in mind that I'm not critiquing game theory or MatPat, just the theory itself. Without any further ado, let's start with part one, the era before the games. Our story begins not in the 1980s, or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. A bold start to be sure, but not unbelievable. Right away, I kind of want to play defense for game theory here. I've seen a lot of critique on this part one for a few reasons, mainly the time placement and the type of show involved. A lot of people on Twitter were incredulous that a grizzly bear could literally sing, and talking bears were apparently canon in this universe. I agree, bears can't literally sing, but what else would you call this in advertising? When performing animals howl along with instruments, the advertisements say the singing animal. This is a practice as old as performing animals and is on every America's Funniest Home Videos episode ever. No one is saying that the actual bear of Fred Bear's singing show was literally singing words. It was probably just a band playing music and a bear that was roaring to the music with it. Which, in the 1930s, that's a pretty good show. As far as the date goes, it is wild to start a FNAF theory in the 1930s, I understand. And while I'm not exactly sure what time would be better here, I don't think 1930s is that unbelievable, to be honest. Let's just say hypothetically he was born in 1930. Then by the time William Afton dies in the Follow Me minigames, he's about 60-ish years old, which I think is completely reasonable. Besides, look at his canon human model. It's not like he looks young, or good for that matter. I've also seen some people pointing out that that would mean Henry would be over 100 years old by the time we get to FNAF 6, but would that be assuming that Henry and William are the same age? Because I don't think they would be. Frankly, we know nothing about Henry's age, but we can speculate it. Fred Bear's Family Diner opened in the 1970s, and we can assume that Henry had a restaurant before this, at least if we're going off of the game theory continuity. So we would need to estimate an age range where he'd be old enough to own and operate a restaurant in the 60s, but still be young enough to be kicking and do the Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria Simulator stuff during 2023. That's a 60 year difference, but if Fred Bear's was open in the 70s, it's not a huge leap from where we're starting anyway. I'd say 25 is a reasonable age to own a restaurant, which would then have Henry reaching the prime age of 85 years old in Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria Simulator, which I know that sounds pretty old to be doing everything Henry does in that game, but keep in mind, even if that's not true and Henry was 25 in the 70s, then he'd still be 75 in Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria Simulator. Like, no matter how which way we slice this, Henry's pretty up there in age come FNAF 6. Speaking of a younger Henry, though, that could add to the resentment that William feels towards him. Not only has this person come in and basically did everything William did but better and then bailed him out of bankruptcy, but it's gotta sting deeper when all all of that is coming from someone eight years his junior. The rest of his part one I think is pretty straightforward, and most of the stuff I think a lot of people agree on, myself included. Henry and William running Fredbear's Family Diner and eventually Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, experimenting and creating new animatronics, and William's resentment towards Henry getting a little bit bigger every day. This is the main reason I didn't want to do a video on just part one. The beginning of the FNAF timeline is so hard to theorize about because we really know very little about it. I think this interpretation is fairly cohesive. Frankly, I don't have a lot to say about it outside of, that's an interesting way to think about it. It's not my preferred way, but I don't fault you for it. It's day 13, if I've been counting correctly. Not like I can see the sun. Batteries. There's gotta be batteries here somewhere, or at least a sponsor. This might do the trick. 
Today's video is sponsored by Morgan & Morgan Injury Law Firm. Injured and don't know where to start? With Morgan & Morgan, it's so easy. You don't have to visit a law office or schedule this timely consultation. In eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. In fact, you can submit your case details, sign contracts, upload documents and medical records, all from your cell phone. In fact, with Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever having to get off the couch. And why wouldn't you want to? They're America's largest injury law firm, and that means they have the resources to fight for you. And fight they do. They've recovered over $15 billion for their clients. Because when you hire Morgan & Morgan, you don't just get a lawyer. You get a dedicated legal team, case investigators, paralegals, and customer care specialists. And representation needs to be easy to find when you need it most. Like when you get in a car accident, there are steps you have to take when that happens. Of course, make sure you and the other person are okay. Call the police for a police report. Contact your insurance. And then, make sure you have representation. And even though with other people, representation can cost a lot, not so much with Morgan & Morgan, because their fee is free. And you only pay if they win. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less, without having to leave your couch. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash rytoast, or dial pound law. That's pound 529 from your cell phone. Thanks again to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's video. Morgan & Morgan, for the people. Huh. Batteries, this, this is exactly what I needed. I mean, they're AAA, I built it with AA in mind, but I can make this work. I can contact the outside. So now let's move on to the meat of the timeline, part two. If you've been subscribed to this channel for any amount of time, and if you haven't, it's right there, just saying. I think a lot of you can guess how I feel about this part two. I agree with a lot of it. Let's touch on some major points. Right away, this is my preferred order of the early deaths in the franchise, although I could swap one of them. But let me tell you how validating it is to hear someone else venting their frustrations on how the game re really sets up the idea that Elizabeth dies before the crying child. But then the game also says, actually, the crying child dies first. Because he's right, so much of the games point to Elizabeth dying first. The empty sister room in FNAF 4. The camera system in Little Fred Bears. The kid seeing something and getting scared of it. The stomach mouths on the nightmare animatronics. Except for the fact that the sister location is stated to open after Freddy shuts down. And if Elizabeth died first, why did Afton build murder robots. It just doesn't work, so you just have to pick one and try to justify it otherwise. I don't fault anyone for going either way on that order. I personally do think it makes more narrative sense for the crying child to die first. At least it makes William a much more compelling character if we look at it that way. Now we have another point of contention. Midnight Motorist. At this point, whenever somebody asks me if I could have one thing clearly answered by Scott about the FNAF lore, which happens a lot actually, my default answer is what exactly happens and is being told to us via the Midnight Motorist minigame. Because, man, we have no idea. It's the one sticking point in older FNAF games that still no one has a clear idea on. At least, I don't think so. The best any of us can do is guess. So much of it is cryptic, and with a minigame that has as many details as Midnight Motorist, pretty much the most detail-packed minigame in the entire series, we don't know what it means. I've had a few interpretations in the past on this minigame, some I agree with more than others, but I think overall I tend to stick with my first one that I made a full video on. In essence, it agrees a lot with what MatPat presented in his timeline video. Juniors being mentioned as an allusion to the drinking problem the gameplay of Midnight Motorist itself alluding to drunk driving, the tire tracks from the Security Puppet minigame. However, I don't fully agree with the locations he's specified. It's a minor thing, but he states that this restaurant, and by extension, the murder of Charlotte, takes place at Fredbear's family diner. Her death and the crying child's happening so close to each other is what eventually shuts down the restaurant. I don't agree with that. Here's why. In the FNAF 4 minigame, we see that the crying child's house and Fredbear's family diner are practically next door to each other. And yes, you could argue that this is just the game making it so you don't have to walk a full length of blocks, but one, they're at least close enough that a small child could walk from Fredbear's to his home very easily, and two, the sister location break room doubles down on this layout of the house and Fredbear's. Furthermore, the sister location bunker is connected to the power sources of the animatronics in Fredbear's family diner, and we are pretty sure the sister location bunker is located in or directly around William Afton's home. 
So if the sister location bunker is close enough to Fredbear's family diner to have direct access to the power of its animatronics, and it's in or around the Afton household, then by the transitive property, we can assume that Fredbear's is fairly close to the Afton household. And if Midnight Motorist is anything to go by, William Afton drives a long distance to come from the murder site. But even if we're not going off of there, do we know a building that would be near William Afton's home in Midnight Motorist that follows a generally same structure of layout? Yeah, Junior's. Keep in mind that these mini games try to tell us as much information with as little direct information as possible. That's why I think Junior's was the perfect clue. Junior's is stationed there not only to show us that William probably has a drinking problem, but that Fredbear's Family Diner is closed by the time Midnight Motorist happens, and since then has reopened as a bar under new management. Freddy Fazbear Pizza would then be a restaurant further away a restaurant that could explain the gameplay in Midnight Motorist. This would even further be supported by the books. Freddy Fazbear Pizza and Fredbear's Family Diner are a good drive away, and Fredbear's is in a pretty no-name town, which is what looks like Midnight Motorist. After all, for a brand new restaurant, it was probably more financially viable to go with a location that's a bit more remote. And then when they got more funding from Fredbear's, they could open Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in a more populated area. This would also give Afton even more reason to go after Henry. Not only did Henry's machine kill his son, and Henry's ideas initially bankrupt him and have to be saved by him, but now Henry's robotics caused the only restaurant with any remnant of William's direct characters, Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie, to be shut down. If Fred Bear's family diner shut down, that'd be the straw on the camel's back. At this point, sure, Henry saved William's business, but he also fully took it over. None of William's original characters would be in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, but one of Henry's was Chica. That could even be part of the reason why it was the first suit William used to stuff a child into. He probably has a lot of resentment if Chica's party world truly was Henry's IP. All this to say, even though it could be argued a few different ways, Personally, I think the most likely order of events of the early deaths in the franchise are the Bite of 83 sending the crying child into a coma who would later die, Fredbear's being shut down because of this, then William going to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza location and killing Charlotte. We then see the Midnight Motorist minigame. Then later, he goes on to kill children at the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza restaurant to one get back at Henry and shut down his restaurant, after all his robots shut down Williams, or possibly just to get back at the children who picked on his son when he was alive, or even just out of anger. Before we move on in the timeline though, I have a few more points for this section. I pretty much fully agree with his interpretation of Midnight Motorist's characters, William, Mrs. Afton, and Michael being the runaway. But I do have one disagreement. At this point, I'm not sure if the crying child could manifest a ghost like Fredbear. Sure, Michael could have just seen a hallucination, but I think the footprints in the mud are telling us that something happened, not just Michael's imagination. After all, I don't even think the crying child can move around Golden Freddy. He seemed to be the most of a victim in this entire franchise. He's kind of a mirror for Jake in the Stitch Line Stingers. And I probably will at some point do a video just about the Stitch Wraith Stingers, but I'm not done reading them yet. However, for the record, I don't think the Stitch Wraith Stingers are canon to the game's timeline, I do think they are a very, very direct and clear allegory for Cassidy and the Crying Child within Golden Freddy. Which, by the way, is I think the direction that game theory is going to be taking in this timeline. But we'll get there when we get there. All this to say, I don't think these footprints are due to a hallucination or a ghost. Instead, I think these footprints would belong to an animatronic exoskeleton placed there by William to keep Michael from breaking out, something that apparently Michael has been known to do. I think most interpretations of these footprints are valid, but that's just my preference. Oh, and to be clear, if you're interpreting things in this franchise and you're using at least some modicum of evidence, I think that's perfectly valid, even if I completely disagree with your conclusion. But even if you don't, can we as a community just agree to be a lot less vitriolic to new ideas in the theory space? Like, not to get on a soapbox, but a small but very loud section of this community needs to chill. The whole point of theorizing and brainstorming is coming up with new ideas, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and seeing what we can learn for it. Literally like they used to say in school, there's no stupid questions. Theorizing is just coming up with new questions. The reason there's no stupid questions is because we don't know the answers yet. And even if we did, it's still valuable to see how someone else thought about something. Take a look at FNAF's recent Midnight Motors video. Do I fully agree? with it? No. But are there parts of it that I think are really interesting and worthwhile that I want to delve into? Yes. But even if I disagreed with every single second of that video, it doesn't excuse this. I want to be perfectly clear, and I am not mincing words. If you are in this community and you see a fan theory about a cryptic 
pizza bear game that you don't agree with, even if it's clearly and demonstrably wrong. And your first reaction is to belittle, spread hate, be condescending, or even worse, aggressive or threatening. You need to look inward. Seek therapy. I can't help you. But I can tell you, going online and acting like that will not fill the void that you have in your heart. Anyway, moving on with the timeline. I actually really like the justification for Cassidy being the one you should not have killed. Up until now, I personally have never found a good, or at least a narratively satisfying reason why Cassidy, of all people, should be this vengeful spirit. But making it so that William got carried away, perhaps a bit too violent, and mirroring Toy Chica's descriptions of how she would get hers works really well. Not to mention the Toy Chica cutscene that would tell us how William killed Cassidy comes like one or two cutscenes right before the Golden Freddy twitching at the end of Ultimate Custom Night. It just fits really well. Also, I really like using this detail from the FNAF 2 minigame to show us when William first saw possession happening. I never really thought about it in context. And then that would give us a reason for the fun times to exist. William directly seeing a robot possessed? Of course he would try to recreate that. And he would need test subjects. How to get those? Make robots that can kidnap kids for you. But when it backfires on his own daughter, he scraps the entire idea. It's too dangerous, too public. Everything would get put in the bunker. That way, he still would have made robots to kidnap children, but never actually sent them out because of the backfiring on his own daughter. But he still needs test subjects. And this is another big deviation I have with the MatPat timeline so far. Now, it seems like he's going towards Molten MCI, a theory that I personally believe. For those not in the know, Molten MCI is the theory that Molten Freddy and Scrap Baby came from Ennard when he split apart. Ennard came from the fun times, and the remnant energy within the fun times came from the souls of the missing child incident victims. His belief is a pretty common one I've seen with a lot of merit to it. Essentially, the Follow Me minigames happen in order, but they don't happen all at the same night. William collects the soul-possessed metal from the animatronics and then leaves, does the experiments, and then comes back either for more metal or the spring bonnie suit. That way nights one through four happen, then there's space for sister location to happen, then the night five one where he dies happens. I think personally with the information we have currently, I disagree with this interpretation, mainly because I don't think it's necessary to break these up like that. Go back to FNAF 2. We are told not only that the withered suits are being used for spare parts, but the website teasers like something borrowed something new double down on this idea that pieces from these withered animatronics are being used in the toy animatronics. I think that because of this, the toy animatronics become possessed. Not by the dead child incident that we see in FNAF 2, but rather the pieces of soul from the missing child incident from the original animatronics. It would kind of be like a rudimentary form of remnant injection, taking haunted metal from one thing, putting it into a new thing, and then that new thing becomes haunted as well. How does that idea help us? Well, in the newspaper at the end of FNAF 2, we know that the Rithered suits are kept in case they can reopen someday, but the toys are scrapped. Now all William would have to do is dumpster dive to some scrapped animatronics and get the remnant out of there. After all, he was at the FNAF 2 location when he first witnessed the effects of possession. That's why their movement in sister location is so erratic. Erratic, just like the toys in FNAF 2. The other part I'm a little fuzzy on is the placement of Follow Me, and with it, the spring locking of Willy. However, because more details about Follow Me are most likely going to come in part three, we can save that for that part. We're kind of running up against the end of part two, and there's things that haven't been mentioned yet that I think are going to be mentioned in part three, most of it being Michael's involvement in this part of the timeline. But we'll see when we get there. For now, let's take stock of where we are. So far, I like this theory a lot, and I agree with a good amount of it. The things I don't agree with I can at least see where he's coming from. So far, I don't really have any major problems. And it really helps that he's sourcing where he's getting this information, either from the games or the books. And I can see that the books are being a big help on interpreting some of the uninterpretable parts of the games. Frankly, trying to make a timeline without the books gives you some weird results. If you want to see those results, go ahead and click that video. For now, a huge shout out to the best patrons, The Toasted Slices, Emberisk, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chickpea, Lola Fembo, The Viper 26, Lehan, James Reiner, Emily De La Sierra, INGD, Givo, Snowblossom, Nika, Raven Eris, Angel, Glamrock Bonnie is an Agani, Dionysus, Bucky Ray, Mariah R, Razvan Rooks, and Luce Harriet. And until next time, as always, stay toasty, Slices.